Israel says it will not heed to international pressure and will finish the job in Rafah. And an aid ship loaded with 200 tons of food reaches the shoreline of Gaza. Hello, I'm Mike Walter, and this is The Heat. An Israeli delegation is heading to Qatar to continue negotiations with Hamas on a temporary ceasefire and the release of hostages. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu met with his war cabinet on Friday and approved plans for a military operation in Gaza's southernmost city of Rafah. The Israeli military says it will evacuate civilians to what it calls humanitarian islands in the middle of the Gaza Strip. Earlier, I spoke with Bill Deary. He's the director of the Washington Representative Office with the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine, known as UNRWA. I asked him about humanitarian efforts and Israel's plans for Rafah. This is, uh, the, the essential thing here is that there needs to be a place for innocent civilians um, to evacuate to. Uh, right now, there's about 1.2 million people in Rafah. The, the population density doesn't allow any reasonable way to protect civilians. Uh, we're going to have problems nonetheless. How do you get supplies in? Uh, how do you keep water, clean water generation going? Uh, we have not uh, gotten any information yet, to my knowledge, at least, uh, concerning uh, a plan to uh, uh, evacuate people to these uh, humanitarian, I believe, islands was the term you used. Um, our, my experience in uh, Khan Yunus was that uh, folks uh, started receiving uh, texts and, and messages uh, to leave uh, the Khan Yunus area. They passed through Israeli checkpoints. And what happened was, uh, as they passed through the checkpoints, they had to leave everything behind. They were allowed only to bring uh, a backpack or a, a, a bag at most. So you saw these heartbreaking scenes of people leaving every, basically everything they had at the side of the road in order to escape uh, uh, the Khan Yunus area uh, in the last uh, uh, military operation. And Bill, uh, I think that really kind of gets to the whole point of uh, kind of this yo-yo uh, activity. You know, you're in one area, you're going to move here, and now you're going to move there. Uh, you don't get to take possessions with you. You, you have to live through all the trauma uh, associated with what's going on there. Um, I've heard some people say it's a looming humanitarian catastrophe. Others just drop the word looming and say it's a humanitarian catastrophe. What are your people on the ground uh, saying about the situation now? Uh, I would say that we're not using looming any longer. Um, the situation is quite dire. Um, basically, uh, it, 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 it's, it's degrees of how bad off you are. Um, the further north you go, uh, the worse it gets. So Rafa is the south, uh, but it gets worse the further north you go. Uh, you go north uh, into the very far north of Gaza, there are pockets of malnutrition and starvation. Uh, according to uh, uh, my colleague who uh, manages UNRWA operations in Gaza, he told me an hour ago, doctors are now seeing visible signs of malnutrition. Uh, there are new waves of displacement headed south because of the lack of food in the north. Uh, but in Rafa itself, you're starting to see people trying to move back to the middle area to avoid um, uh, what could be a pending military action. You know, uh, Bill, there's a ship towing a barge with 200 tons of food uh, that left Cyprus, uh, and, it, and it has reached the shores of northern Gaza. Of course, this is an operation from the World Central Kitchen uh, run by Chef Jose Andreas. Um, and Jose, in an interview this weekend, said, we cannot fail the people of Gaza. Um, that's one effort. We're seeing uh, other efforts. Of course, uh, U.S. President Biden talking during the State of the Union about creating this uh, port uh, and pier off the coast of Gaza, but that's going to take a long time to actually be put in place. Um, and you're hearing from non-governmental organizations, I think 25 of them, saying, look, this, air and sea missions are nice, but they're no alternative to land delivery. So give us an idea of, of, of the situation on the ground and the ability to get things uh, in by truck. Well, you've got it exactly right. 
the most effective way to deal with this crisis is to it is via trucks at scale and uh, in volume. I mean, it needs to be every day, not once a day. Let, let me take a step back, though, to give you a little bit of context, if I might. Uh, an airdrop uh, is the equivalent of one third of a humanitarian aid truck. Um, a we understand uh, that the uh, and, and uh, incidentally, uh, as I said, I talked to my uh, counterpart in Gaza uh, in Rafa an hour ago, who uh, complimented the World Central pitching on the tremendous job they're doing. But uh, the ship that arrived uh, from Cyprus is still uh, the equivalent of only 12 trucks. Now, what we need is 500 trucks a day coming in. And just to be clear, only about 200 of those trucks need to be uh, UN trucks. What we need to do here is restore some semblance of commercial activity through you know, the use of these 300 other trucks. Um, and also, frankly, what's needed is uh, we, we need places, uh, we need crossings. We need particularly crossings in the north. Uh, the best possible place uh, to uh, bring aid uh, ships in would be the Ashdod port. Um, but you need, you, you need to have at scale and consistent delivery of humanitarian aid. And give us an idea, 500 trucks, that's a, a large number. What are we seeing now? Goodness me, maybe 150 mm. uh, on a good day. And uh, the number of trucks uh, dropped dramatically between January and February. Um, and I think it's back a little bit on the rise now, but it's well short of what is required to deal with this humanitarian situation in Gaza. And I think if our viewers think about that, that's compounded. I mean, if you need 500 a day and you're getting 150, I mean, that's, uh, but. Exactly let's... right, that's yeah. exactly right. That's, it's, it becomes a kind of sad uh, exercise in math. Yeah, let me ask you about this distribution center in Rafa, operated by UNRWA that was hit by an Israeli airstrike on Wednesday. Uh, the Israeli military says uh, it bombed an air aid warehouse, uh, claiming it had precisely targeted and killed a Hamas commander. Uh, the United Nations, though, says the attack killed at least one aid worker, injured 22 others. You, you mentioned you talked to your man on the ground there. Uh, this is really un undoubtedly the, the situation so dire for aid workers. This doesn't make things any better, actually. I would think it, it, it produces even more jitters. Can you describe uh, what you're hearing from them about this? Uh, certainly, it was. Uh, we understand it was a drone strike. Uh, I, I don't have any. Uh, obviously, uh, we don't have any intelligence on the the target, but we do know that one of our workers died. Uh, the gentleman was stacking diapers at that moment. For goodness' sake, uh, twenty-two others uh, have been injured or are in the hospital, and to, you know to to strike within the compound of a United Nations uh, facility is is very disturbing, uh, as well as the fact that this warehouse is one of our main warehouses in the Rafa area. Secretary of State Blinken said Israeli government has a responsibility and an obligation to make sure that humanitarians can do their job, and clearly um, not bombing where they work is, is, uh, is key to that. Uh, do you think there's been enough condemnation of what's happened? Well, it's not uh, for me to opine on that, but I, I will tell you what we do. Um, UNRWA, indeed the UN, communicates with the Israelis every day the location of all of our facilities. This is, this is not uh, due to a lack of knowledge uh, of where uh, UN folks are operating. In fact, folks do need to understand as well, uh, you know, UNRWA and our UN counterparts just don't wake up in the middle of the day and, or in the morning and say, hey, we're going to take a truck up to, north, up to the north. Every action of ours has to be fully coordinated with the Israeli military. Otherwise, you are um, susceptible to military action. Bill Deary speaking to me earlier. For more, let's bring in our panel. Joining us from London is Abdul Bari Atwan. He's the editor-in-chief of Rai Al-Yum, 
Also in London, Yossi Meckelberg. He's an associate fellow of the Middle East and North Africa program at Chatham House. And here in Washington, D.C., Dan Orbell is a scholar in residence at the Center for Israeli Studies at American University. Dan, let me start with you. Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu meeting with his war cabinet, talking about a potential uh, ceasefire deal with Hamas. But he says their demands are unrealistic. What can you tell us about the negotiations? So I understand that uh, Hamas's proposal has been uh, forwarded to Israel. Uh, they're asking a lot. Uh, they're asking for many prisoners in return for Israeli hostages, some prisoners who have murdered uh, innocent Israelis. Obviously, also, they're asking for the withdrawal of Israeli forces and a permanent ceasefire or stop to the war, uh, demands that Israel cannot agree to. Still, Israel is giving this a shot, and uh, on Sunday, it will send a team negotiating team to Qatar for continued negotiations. So uh, we're, we're, we now have kind of the parameters of what each side wants, and hopefully uh, the two sides can reach uh, a compromise which will pave the way for an agreement. Uh, the relatives of those taken, obviously very frustrated uh, each day, uh, is, is misery for them, as, as one could imagine. Um, do we know the fate of the remaining hostages? We don't know the fate of all of them. Uh, the number right now is 134, out of which 100 are believed to still be alive, among them young women, uh, a mom, children, elderly, handicapped, and also men and soldiers. And so uh, we, we place all, I mean, all these are, are held by Hamas for 161 days, and uh, there's an expectation, a demand by Israel for their uh, immediate release, for their safety, for their well-being. Uh, and so uh, we just have to wait and see. Uh, Israel has demanded to get a list of names, hasn't gotten that yet. Uh, and so uh, we, we have to wait and see what happens. Yeah, and those negotiations are going to be key. Abdul, uh, Israeli's prime minister, also approving plans to uh, move forward with this invasion of the southern city of Rafah, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, the United States and the United Nations are, are warning that a full-scale assault in Rafah could be disastrous. But let's listen to what Netanyahu had to say, and I want to get your reaction on the other side. Yes. There are international pressures to prevent us from entering Rafah and completing the work. As Prime Minister of Israel, I push away these pressures. We have been doing this successfully for five months already. This is record time in the history of Israel's wars. I will continue to push away the pressures. We will enter Rafah. We will complete the elimination of the rest of Hamas's battalions. We will restore security and we will bring total victory to the people of Israel. Abdul, uh, the United Nations estimates there's currently about 1.4 million uh, Palestinians in Rafah. Uh, the Israeli military, as we wanted, pointed out to, to Bill Deary, uh, want to move these to, like, humanitarian islands. But, but I want to get your sense of, of how you see this unfolding. By the way, <clears throat> incidentally, you know, my family are from Rafah, and I've been in touch with them from time to time. You know, when Mr. Netanyahu is saying that we are going to attack Rafah and evacuate the people, I don't know, you know, how many people, how many thousands will be massacred by Netanyahu. You know, there are a million and a half a million of those people are living now crowded in Rafah. So if the Israeli bombardment started, you know, maybe, you know, 20,000, 30,000 of people would be killed. You know, until now, the, about 31, thousand Palestinians were massacred by the Israeli warplanes. So how many people will be killed in Rafah? You know, I, I'm, I'm surprised. I, I, you know, the Americans said that the, the Rafah is a red line. And, you know, without a plan to protect the civilian there, it will be a disaster. Why United States wouldn't say to the Israeli, enough is enough. Now there are talks for a ceasefire. Let us see what will, what will be the outcome of this talks. After that, we will discuss the situation. But Netanyahu is saying, you know, I uh, agreed about the plans to attack. Rafah, and he will go ahead with it. So it means there will be more bloodshed. And uh, your guest uh, talked about starvation. I'm telling you, you know, our children are dying of mal malnutrition, of starvation, because, you know, there is no any kind of human aid to them. There is no food. They did eat the animal foods, you know, 
strong in order to survive. And it is a disaster. Why United States doesn't stop this actually disaster? Why they don't protect the civilian there? What about the liberal world? What about the human values? What about, you know, the freedom of people? Why we cannot live in peace in our territories? Why the Israeli are bombing us? It is not a war between Israel and Hamas. It is a war between Israel and the Palestinian people, the civilian people. Until now, Hamas men are still, you know, maybe a quarter of them were killed. But, you know, but the civilian are massacred. It is genocide in Gaza now. And my, I lost more than 40 people of my family in Gaza because of the Israeli bombardment. And if they invade Rafah, if they attack Rafah, I am I'm, I'm sure this number will be doubled, maybe tripled. You know, most of them there are frightened to death because of this Israeli threats to storm Rafah. Well, they stormed Khan Yunus, they stormed Gaza, they stormed middle of Gaza, middle of the, the, uh, yeah, the occupied territories, and look what happened. Uh, so 75,000 okay. people injured. 31,000 people were killed, right. most All of right. them children and women. All right, Abdul. Uh, Yossi, uh, let me ask you about a, a timeline for this. Uh, and, and what happens if there is a temporary ceasefire? Do you, how do you see that playing into this? Well, I, I think right now it's, it's on a knife edge whether there is going to be a ceasefire uh, or not. At certain point, ceasefire will be achieved. The question is for how long. Until, along until it's achieved, whether it's before an operation in, in Rafa or not, which will claim ma ma many lives. But at the same time, if a ceasefire, a six-week ceasefire agreement on it is reached, it might create a different dynamic. Because in this dynamic, the hostages, the Israeli hostages will be released. Uh, prisoners will be uh, so, uh, be released. At the same time, more humanitarian aid will aid, uh, will enter in, in, into Gaza. Uh, maybe at the, the end of it, the, the floating dock that the United States promised to build uh, will be all, already operational. So it might create also thinking of the day after the war, and the war then won't be resumed. But this is not guaranteed, because right now, and this is one of the major issues that, 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 that remain uh, between the sides, it's the, keep the gap between the sides, is whether uh, what Israel wants is six uh, weeks uh, truce and then resume, resume the hostilities, resume what they say they can destroy Hamas. On the other hand, obviously, this is not an attractive proposition for Hamas, would like to see a permanent, a, a, a permanent a, a ceasefire, and I think this is exactly where they try to, uh, to whether Qatar or Egypt, the United States will try to to breach these differences be, uh, between them. But I think after uh, nearly six months of of war, is to try to think about the the new governance for uh, for for Gaza after the war and 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 look. In long term, relations between the between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Well, speaking of government, uh, the U.S. Senate Majority Leader here in the United States, uh, Chuck Schumer, uh, spoke out rather forcefully uh, about Netanyahu uh, on the Senate. Uh, well, uh, he's saying he's a major obstacle to peace and called for new elections. Let's watch what he had to say. Prime Minister Netanyahu has lost his way by allowing his political survival to take the precedence over the best interests of Israel. At this critical juncture, I believe a new election is the only way to allow for a healthy and open decision-making process about the future of Israel. Dan, uh, as you know, Schumer is the highest ranking uh, Jewish uh, legislator in the United States. Um, and, and a longtime supporter of uh, Israel. Uh, how is this speech going over in Israel? I think that uh, people were very surprised in Israel by Schumer's comments. Uh, some agree with him, some disagree with him. I think that uh, in, in general, there's a increased pressure by the administration, by democratic leaders here in the United States, uh, you know, one asking, demanding Mr. Netanyahu to uh, handle the war in a different way. Uh, 
uh, expecting him to, uh, you know, to be more forthcoming when it comes to the fighting, when it comes to humanitarian assistance, when it comes to the negotiations and a ceasefire. And so, uh, and I think that they're clearly uh, seeing Mr. Netanyahu as, 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 as a problem. Um, in Israel, um, you know, again, some have come to his defense. Uh, many others um, have, have shared the, the same frustrations and, and grievances that Schumer has articulated in his speech yesterday. Uh, Yossi, uh, all this nudging by the United States doesn't seem to be having any impact on him, though, does it? Uh, not for now, I think, but in the in the in the longer term, yes. I think, on the one hand, uh, personally, I agree with what Chuck Schumer said. You know, this is time for Israel to see beyond uh, the Netanyahu era that as it is, is, is stretched for 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 too long, and 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 Mr. Schumer is is right to say that Netanyahu and his government uh, lost lost their, their 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 way. On the other, it's also problematic when 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 the leader and someone, as you mentioned, the, the Iraq official uh, in in a, in one country intervene in the domestic affairs of another country. So there is an issue there too. But at the same time, this is a close ally of the United States that right now also harm the interests of the United States. And there is the basic disagreements, by the way, that go even before the war itself to, to the, the protest against the, 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 the assault by the Israeli government on the, on, on the democratic system in Israel. And that's, the, it's, it's a slow process. Uh, right now, Netanyahu has a majority, quite a stable majority uh, in, 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 in the Knesset. But at the same time, we see public opinion polls that want to see him out. So I think part of, of what we are going to see is first to see the end of the war, at least along truth. And then I think the domestic, the, 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 the domestic political pressures with Israel will go also to change the Netanyahu government and to see the end of Netanyahu political uh, career. Well, you talked about the end of war. Uh, he's saying uh, again that he's against a two-state solution, which of course is the U.S. policy, and Joe Biden's been pushing that. So how, does, how do these two peoples coexist after this war in a Netanyahu world? I, I really think that's, you know, when when there is truth, when the, you know, the, the, the sides will have time also to rethink and uh, about about what actually they managed to achieve, uh, obviously from 7 of October and later, but also before, on, on only misery, only death, only devastation. I think this is time for, for both sides to rethink the, the, their policies to come up with, with new leadership. But also there was what I see as a criminal neglect by the international community, which we saw the price for it is also regional instability, how, we enter into, how it enters into the domestic discourse in, in different countries. And there should be a concerted effort, both within these countries, but also by the international community, to look into some modality of a two-state solution. But I think in sort of looking only at the technicalities of a two-state solution, to look at the values, what it comes with that, in which all people that live between uh, the, the, the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea enjoy the same uh, equal rights. What are the kind of the modality of a two-state solution? I think this is open to the full negotiation. Well, and Abdul, uh, what about that? The international community, what should they be doing to, to achieve that? Well, you know, we are talking about two-state solution. Let me ask you a question here. How can you have a neighbor like Benjamin Netanyahu, who massacred 31,000 of your people and destroying 86 percent of your, of your uh, Gaza Strip, and also wounded more than 70,000 or 75,000, and destroyed most of the hospital there, and impo imposed some sort of a sanction, a blockade against the people there, and also lead them to die from starvation. How can you have two-state solution without somebody like this? How can you be safe? 
safe in your place, in your in your in your state. You know, if if, if there is a Palestinian state, this is the problem. The international community should interfere. When Mr. Shamar said, you know, Netanyahu is destroying the Israeli people or destroying the Israel, he is not destroying the Israeli people only. He is destroying us. He is destroying the Palestinians. He is destabilizing the whole of the Middle East. He put the United States in trouble. Look, there is a war in Yemen against United States ships. There is also a war in Iraq. The Iraqi would like to kick out the, all the American bases on Iraq. And also, there is a war in Syria. So how can we, you know, we have to say the truth to the people. Netanyahu uh, and the Israeli uh, government is a threat to the whole of the Middle East and destabilizing the whole of the Middle East and all hopes of normalization of relation between Israel and the Middle East is completely evaporated completely. So I think, yes, we, we have been listening and hearing about the two-state solution for the last 35 years. You know, what we get instead, you know, we did not have a, a, two, a state for the Palestinians. We had about 800,000 settlers in the West Bank, which is supposed to be the nucleus of this independent state. And so, uh, also, the Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas appointed a longtime advisor, Mohammed Mustafa, as prime minister this week to basically form a new government. Is that a step in the right direction? Yes, you know, okay. You know, Mahmoud Abbas are, are actually listening to the American, and he actually, uh, you know, um, uh, implementing what they are saying to him. They said to him, okay, you have to rectify your uh, uh, authority. He did. He appointed a new prime minister, hoping that, you know, this actually will make the American, you know, to commit himself to Oslo Agreement, which was signed in the White House between the Israeli and the Palestinian. Well, are they going to? To actually respond to this gesture from uh, Mahmoud Abbas? Are they going actually to help him? His actual popularity is down among the Palestinians. So I think the American must do a lot, must actually keep their words, must work for real two-state solution, not actually to let the Israeli destroy the or Netanyahu destroy the Israeli and the Palestinian at the same time. And uh, Yossi, uh, the State Department did uh, induce some sanctions against three Israeli settlers in the West Bank. Um, we only have about 30, 40 seconds. Do those sanctions have any impact at all? Well, it's, it's, it's a beginning. It's, uh, right now, it's symbolic, but it sends the message that the United States says enough is enough about uh, settler violence, and they will gradually, it's not the first time, it's the second kind of way of, 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 of sanctions. But it's kind of sending message to Israel: if you want to deal with uh, uh, terror, if, with sorry, settler violence, we will deal with that. All right. I want to thank all of our participants in this debate. Enjoyed it. Uh, thank you so much for your insights. And that's going to do it for us. I'm Mike Walter in Washington D.C. Thanks so much for watching.